All right, everybody take your Bibles today and stand with me, if you will. Acts chapter 9 is where we're at today. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Uh, man, it feels good to feel good. <laughs> hey, Byron, it feels good to feel good. Praise God. Hey, say this with me today. We are the church. Come on. The body of Christ. There it is. Filled with the Spirit of Christ. Continuing the work of Christ in the earth today. That's what the book of Acts is all about, friend. Let's say it one more time. We are the church. The body of Christ. Filled with the Spirit of Christ. Continuing the work of Christ in the earth today. I want you to look at that slide just for a second. The church is the ecclesia. We're called out of darkness. You got to be called out of darkness before you can be part of the church. Certainly you belong. You're, you are totally unconditionally loved and accepted no matter what background, religion, uh, whatever you, you are, whoever you are. You're totally loved and accepted and you belong here. But to be part of the ecclesia, you have to be called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are the church. And what is the church? It's the body of Christ. David just mentioned it in sort of a funny way. We are the ears, the nose, the eyes, the hands, the feet of Jesus, right? We're the body of Christ. But a dead body is not a good body. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on. That's the life-giving anointing to do what? To do the work of Christ. What is the work of Christ? Acts 10, 38. This Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be outside of these four walls doing good and healing everybody that's oppressed of the devil. We are the church, the body of Christ, filled with the Spirit of Christ, continuing the work of Christ. He ain't stopping. He ain't done yet. He's using you and me in these last days. It feels good to feel good. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. I want to read to you from the New King James Version of the Bible. Then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Sort of sounds like what's going on in Afghanistan. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light, everybody say a light, who suddenly a light shone around him from heaven and then he fell to the ground i bet he did and he heard a voice saying saul saul why are you persecuting me and he said who are you lord and the lord said i am jesus whom you are persecuting it is hard for you to kick against the goads Let's pray. Father, please send conviction and anointing upon the word of God today and within our hearts. Rebuke, correct, exhort, teach, and instruct in all righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus I ask it. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. He was Christianity's worst nightmare. He was a hater, a hater of the church. He despised the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a murderer and a persecutor of anyone who would call on the name of Jesus, anyone who identified themselves as a follower of Christ. His number one goal was to wipe Christianity off the face of the earth. I'm talking about this man. 
His name is Saul, the number one terrorist of his day. As we pick up in this new chapter, chapter 9 of the book of Acts in our series, we see that Saul was more intent now on destroying the church than ever before. In fact, he probably was thrilled to know that the church began to scatter after he stood there and watched the first martyr, Stephen, be stoned to death. And I'm sure that somehow he thought because of that he was beginning to win the war on Christianity. And so verse 2 tells us that he sent a letter to the high priest in Damascus asking for their cooperation and arresting anyone who was known to be a follower of the way. Now, the way back then, uh, they didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves the way. They, later on, they would call themselves Christians. But Saul begins to make his way to Damascus, and that's when his life and history itself would radically change. Saul experienced this radical conversion by encountering the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot talk about Saul's radical conversion without reading his radical testimony that is found in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. I want to read that to you from the Message Bible. Listen to this, friend. Paul says, here's a word you can take to heart and depend on. <laughs> Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Aren't you glad? He writes and he says, I'm proof, public sinner number one, of someone who could have never made it apart from the sheer mercy of God. And now he shows me off evidence of his endless patience to those who are right on the edge of trusting him forever. Woo! Paul is saying, look, my radical conversion from being a persecutor and a murderer of the church is an example of the amazing mercy and grace of God for anyone in the future who will put their faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to me today, friend. God saved you to show you off. Don't you ever be afraid of your testimony. God saved you to show you off. He wants to show you off to a lost world. He'll show you off to his heavenly angels. He wants to show you off to hell itself. He wants to show you off to your friends and your family who may be right on the verge of trusting Jesus Christ. God saved you to show you off. Come on, somebody say amen. So let me ask you a question today. Have you seen the light? I'm, I'm serious. Have you seen the light? Are you radically saved? Has there been a transformation so deep down in your soul that it has changed you from the inside out? Are you radically saved? Oh, don't misunderstand me. I didn't ask you, do you have a Bible? I didn't ask you if you have a grandmother that's saved. I didn't ask you if you got some religion. I didn't ask you, do you attend church at least once a month? I didn't ask you, have you been baptized in water or have you ever taken communion? I want to know, are you radically turned on for Jesus Christ? Come on. Are you radically saved? Have you seen the light? I believe this passage of Scripture shows us some spiritual realities that took place in Saul's life, and to be honest with you, that ought to be taking place in our life as we surrender to Christ. 
I hope you'll jot down some notes today. You can open your church app and find the notes there. But here they are. The first evidence of a person who has really seen the light, that first evidence is that you'll have a new faith. Everyone who is radically saved will have a new faith. Understand that Paul, he already had faith before his conversion. You see, he was radically religious. He, he goes on to tell us about that. He says, I, I was a Jewish rabbi. I was a leader of the Pharisees. I had a zeal for the law of God. He, he even thought that he was doing, listen to me, he thought he was doing the will of God by destroying the church and murdering Christians. So Saul had faith. He was certainly not an atheist. On the contrary, he had a great zeal for God. But the problem was he had yet to encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. He had a faith, but it wasn't a new faith. See, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. All of us have faith, but not everyone has saving faith. See, there are people today, they put their faith in the words of Muhammad the prophet. And so they join the religion of Islam. There are people today that put their words in the writings of Confucius, who, by the way, was confused. And they joined the Buddhist movement. There are people who have faith in the New Age movement. They put their faith in hugging a tree or kissing a crystal. There are people today outside this building and maybe some inside that put their faith in Satanism or witchcraft or the occult. But if your life is going to be radically transformed, you must put your faith in the only one who has ever paid the price for your sin and rose again from the dead. You must put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ooh, it feels good to feel good. Look at verse 1. <laughs> verse 1. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. You can't, you can't see this in the English language, but when you study Greek language, this is really cool. Because it, that verse gives a vivid word picture of what Saul was like before he was converted. And the language that is used here, <laughs> it carries the idea of a raging wild boar that is out of control. So think about this. This highly sophisticated highly educated religious man is acting like a wild animal. I, I just want to stop and I want to say something to those of you today that are praying fervently for family members and loved ones. I, I want to talk today to some wives that are praying for unsaved husbands and, and you've been praying and up until now your husband has been very nice to you and he's been very kind but you've noticed in the last few months you've been praying for him and he's getting meaner and meaner. In fact, he's starting to tell you stop reading your Bible, quit go into New Life Church because I don't like what's happening in your life. Come on. And, and, and I want to talk to some parents today that are praying for your children and your youth. And, and up until now, everything's been pretty good with a few shaky problems. But the more you pray, the more they get rebellious. Let me tell you what that's called, friend. That's called conviction. That, that's what's happening with Saul. 
Jesus meets him on the Damascus road and, and Jesus says, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you, Saul, to kick against the goads. What, what in the world is a goad? That's, what, that's the way the King James language uses it. It's hard for you to kick against the goad. Well, I brought a picture with me of what a goad is from the Bible days. A goad is one of these things that the shepherds used to have, and it's a rod with a pointed end on it, and they would, they would poke and they would prod the oxen and the cattle along to get them to move down the path they needed them to move. And when they would hit them with the goad every once in a while those animals didn't like it and they would kick against it and in the process of kicking against it they would hurt themselves that's what Saul was doing here there was something down on the inside of Saul that he was trying to fight he was trying to fight off the conviction and the more that he resisted the goad the meaner he became he knew deep down in his soul that he was wrong he knew that his credentials and his education and his theological training and all of his religion was leaving him void and empty I don't know maybe he had nightmares at night seeing the face of Stephen crying out, do not hold this sin against them. All of those things the Holy Spirit was using to, to poke and prick Saul's heart, to prod him along, to get him toward a new faith in Christ. I'm trying to tell you today, friend, never underestimate the power of the goad, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I want you to know today, keep right on praying for that unsaved family member. Keep right on praying for that unsaved teenager. Why? God has a goad. He's the third person of the Trinity, and his name is called the Holy Spirit. He's the hound dog of heaven. And I came to tell somebody today, he will hunt down your husband. He will hunt down your wife. He'll hunt down that wayward son or daughter. He'll hunt down that family member, that neighbor, until they surrender to Jesus Christ. Come on and give God a praise. God has a goad. Woo! Listen to me, friend. I, think about this. God has made it extremely hard for people to go to hell. If you go to hell, you're going to have to climb over a bunch of stuff that God has put in the way to keep you from going there. If you go to hell, first of all, you're going to have to climb over common sense. If you go to hell, you're going to have to climb over your mother's prayers. If you go to hell, you're going to have to climb over the Word of God. If you go to hell, you're going to have to climb over every time somebody has witnessed to you. And most of all, if you go to hell, you're going to have to climb over the goad, the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life. God has made it hard for people to go to hell. But whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mm. Hallelujah. Look at verse 4 and 6. Paul sees this brilliant light that knocks him on his, ooh, knocks him to the ground. <laughs> and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And notice what Saul asked. Who are you? Lord, and the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, notice the second question, Lord, 
what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. I want you to notice something. In those three verses are the two main questions of life. Who is Jesus, and what does he want me to do? That's the two questions you should be asking if you're radically saved. Who is Jesus? Getting a revelation of his person. Who is Jesus? And secondly, what does he want me to do? A revelation of his purpose. It's interesting to me that when you read these letters that Paul would later write, he's always written them with those two questions in mind. Think about it. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, on and on it goes. They're divided into two sections. It's just the way that he wrote, and he wrote like this. The first part of it would be, who is Jesus? Doctrine. The second part of it would be, what does he want me to do? Duty. When you see the light, friend, there'll be a desire within your heart to understand the person of Christ and the purpose of Christ in your life. Why? Because a radical conversion is evidenced by a new faith. Say amen. amen. Secondly, a person who sees the light, number two, will have a new family. A new family. Paul was stricken to the ground by the light, and he tried to get up, but he was blinded. He couldn't see. So he needed someone to lead him. Look at verse 8 and 10. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they, notice, they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. I like this next part. Now there was a certain disciple. <laughs> Thank God for disciples. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Not compromising Ananias, but committed disciple Ananias. And this disciple says to the Lord, after the Lord says in a vision, Ananias, and Ananias says to the Lord, like any good disciple would say, Here am I, Lord. Say that with me. Here am I, Lord. Come on. Come on. Here am I, Lord. That's, that's the cry of any good disciple. Listen. Thank God for Ananias, because I can't help but to think where Paul may have ended up if it wasn't for these men who led him by the hand and took him to Ananias and introduced him to Ananias. And furthermore, if it wasn't for Ananias, I don't know where Paul may have ended up. I, I think about my own life. What about the people in my life right after I was saved who took me by the hand and they, they led me, they, they encouraged me, they spoke truth into my life in love when I needed to hear it. They helped me to, to walk in a, in a deeper walk with Christ. See, when you really see the light, you not only need a new faith, you need a new family. And there are two aspects of the family of God. You need a group of people for encouragement, and you need a grace person in your life for accountability. You need the family of God. You need a new family. There's a lot of people, unfortunately, in the world today that claim that they have seen the light and they're radically saved. But you don't ever see them in the house of God. Hmm? They don't have, they're not part of the family. They're just out there somewhere. Let me just say this. I know I'm going to hurt somebody today, but I'm going to say it anyhow. I'm not talking to those of you that are sick and you're watching online. But I'm talking to some of you right now that are sitting on your couch eating a bag of chips 
munch, 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 and calling that church. Stop using COVID as an excuse for not coming to the house of God. I'm not talking, oh, I gotta I got got put a disclaimer on it because I don't need the emails. I'm not talking to those of you that are older and you're sick. I understand that. I'm talking to people that use what's going on in our world as an excuse and you're full of fear and you're full of anxiety. I'm telling you, you need the family of God. Get to the house of God. You need the family of God. You need the family of God for encouragement, and you need the family of God for accountability. I'm going to tell you something that sends shivers up my spine. I was teaching yesterday to a, a class of basically college-age students down in Columbus and teaching a theology class, and I was sharing this passage of Scripture with them found in 1 Timothy 4, 1. This, this just bothers me. It says that Paul's writing to young pastor Timothy and he's warning him. He's warning him. It, by the way, is it okay to come to the house of God and get a warning? Or do you always just need, hey, everything's going to be good, everything's going to be happy, everything's going to be a bed of roses. Hey, how about a warning from time to time? 1 Timothy 4.1 says, in the last days. How many of you believe we're like in the last, 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 last days? In the last days, many, that bothers me, many, not some, not just a few, but many. Many will do what? Many will depart from the faith. I want to stop and address another thing right now. And that's this damnable doctrine that many preachers preach today, and it's called unconditional eternal security. I'm, I'm eternally secure in Christ, but I'm not unconditionally eternally secure. I've got to continue to heed warnings. I've got to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of God so that I don't fall from my secure position. That's Bible, friend. Don't tell me that I can live like the devil and just do what I want to do and still make it to heaven. That's wrong. Oh, yeah, it's getting weaker and weaker out there. I feel it. Let me ask you a question, friend. If I say to you, hey, at 12 o'clock today, I'm departing from here and I'm, I'm getting on a train and departing from here and going to L.A., that means that I once was here and I'm leaving this position, and now I'm getting on a train, and I'm going somewhere else. So let me ask you a question. How, how, how do you depart from somewhere if you had not been there in the first place? I don't know if you got that or not. Talking about I can, I can live how it's my life. It's not your life. You belong to Christ, you're dead, and your life is no longer your own. Feels good to feel good. Many will depart from the faith. Now, how's that going to happen? Giving heed to seducing spirits. That, that shakes me up. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Do you know what a seducing spirit is? It does this. Come over here. Come over here. Come on. You, you don't need that. Come over here. I've, I've got something better. You, you don't need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Don't listen to that preacher. Come over here. You, 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 you don't need to stay in that marriage. Come on, I've got something better. The grass is greener on the other side. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. That's seducing. Read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs personifies the foolishness of man 
as a seductress. And the wisdom of God crying out in the streets, don't go near her house. He's not just talking about adultery. He's talking about the foolishness and the deceptiveness of our own stinking lives. I don't want to be one of the many who will depart from the faith. So what am I trying to say? I'm not strong enough to make it on my own. This is no Lone Ranger Christianity. I can't make it on my own. I need a structure. I need a system around me that will hold me accountable and encourage me and speak the truth in love to me so that I can grow up in God. If you've seen the light, you need a new family. Last of all, a person who sees the light not only has a new faith and a new family, but the good news is you have a new future. Mm. It's interesting because before Saul, which later became Paul, before Saul was saved, his future was already set. In fact, uh, biblical scholars believe that he would have inherited the position to be the governor of the Jewish Supreme Court. But his life changed radically. On the day that he saw the light, God gave him a brand new future. He was headed this way, and God says, you're not going that way, you're going this way. That's what he does for us. He gives us a new future. I I wanted to be in the music business. And God said, no, you're not going to be in the music business. Come here, boy. April 10th, 1983. Boom, you're going this way. I'm going to make you a pastor. One day, you're going to pastor New Life Church. And one day, Kenny and Sandy Pontius are going to be part of that church. What? They'll never come to church. They're here all the time. He gives us a new future. He blows our mind with stuff. Some of you today, you thought you were going to go to nursing school and you got saved and God said, that's not where you're going. You're going this way. Some of you thought you were going to be a teacher and God said, I'm not going to use you this way. I'm going to use you this way. Some of you thought you were going to be a pilot or a lawyer and God said, I'm not sending you there. I'm sending you there. A new future. (laughs) I want you to notice in verse 15, I I love this, because this is discipleship. This is what this is. Ananias, that that willing disciple, Ananias. I mean, the humanity of, of the Bible is what I love. You know that the Bible is the real word of God because it never cuts humanity any slack. It shows all of our weaknesses and faults and craziness. So this disciple, Ananias, (laughs) he starts arguing with the Lord. Well, wait a minute now. He just got through saying, Here am I, Lord. I'm why I will do anything you want me to. Can you see him praying at his house? Oh Jesus, I love you so much. God, I'll go, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll, I'll welcome anyone you want me to welcome. I'll do what you want me to do. And Jesus shows up in a vision. And, and Jesus says, Jesus says to Ananias, I want you to take Saul into your house. Here my Lord, here my Lord. Wait a minute, Lord. Don't you know who this man is? He's a bad dude. This is a guy that's done a lot of harm to your people. You sure you want him to be part of the family? It's amazing how one minute we're wide open to the voice of the Holy Spirit as long as he speaks what we want him to speak. I'm done. (laughs) 
oh, I better get back online. <laughs> he says, are you sure? You sure you want this guy? Look at verse 15 and 16. But the Lord said to him, go. He, I love this, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles. Notice the new future. To bear my name before Gentiles. Guys, listen to me. The early church was as prejudiced, I almost said as southern Mississippi, but that's... Uh, it was. Salvation was only for the Jews. You got put your mind, let your let your mind go back. Put on your, your first century Jewish glasses and read the scriptures the way it was actually written. They actually believed that salvation was only the Messiah came for the Jews. Now, up until this point, that was all they had. Now watch. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before you could even insert the word dogs because that's the way they were kind of Gentiles, like the scum of the earth. Kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Quickly. Jesus says, I've got a brand new future for Paul. I'm going to use him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to stand before kings. And when we read through the book of Acts here, we know exactly that's what happened. All the way through it, we can see Paul preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, standing before King Agrippa, and, and all of those things. But here's what I want us to see. This, this is a prophetic word for somebody in the house right here. Listen to this. Before God gives Paul a new future and begins to use him in service, he first takes him through a process. And I, I, want, I want you to get this. If you're, if you're, I know I'm speaking to somebody right now. There is a process that, that God takes Saul through at this point. And I want you to see this. Look at verse 23 through 25. God's process in Paul. Number one was solitude. Not after, now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Now that's verse 25. But be between verse 25 and verse 26, even though it's not recorded in the book of Acts, it's recorded in the book of Galatians. There's a lot of stuff that goes on between verse 25 and verse 26. It was after this experience of being let down over the wall and, and, and them rescuing him from this plot, Paul goes to Arabia and he spends time alone, just he and Jesus, on the backside of an Arabian desert. And Paul would later write about this in Galatians 1, 15 and 17. This is basically what he says. He says, after my conversion, I did not consult any man. I didn't run up to Jerusalem to have a meeting with the apostles. Listen to what he says. I was all alone in Arabia. All alone. Boy, that's a sermon in itself. All alone in Arabia. God's process in Saul was solitude. And here's what I have learned. Maybe it's not true for you, but it is for me. There are times in our lives when God is getting ready to turn the page and start a new chapter in our lives that he will call us to a time of solitude, aloneness, a time where we feel all alone. A time where nothing anybody says helps us. Nothing that the preacher says has any impact on us. Everything seems to be against us. Guess what? This is the time when God is processing us for a new future. Solitude. It's good for us at times. Secondly, God's process in Paul was suffering. 
I will show him how many things he must suffer, Jesus said, for my name's sake. All you got to do is read through the entire New Testament letters and you will quickly find out that suffering was a great deal of Paul's life. He was mobbed in Jerusalem. He was mocked in Athens. He was martyred in Rome. He suffered for the cause of Christ. Now, I know this isn't popular preaching and it doesn't make you feel good, but if you will take and read through the full counsel of God's Word, there's no denying that suffering is part of following Jesus Christ. Just because you're radically saved and you've seen the light doesn't mean that you're not going to have any suffering and trial in your life. In fact, the Bible says God uses our suffering to refine our faith, to cause our character to become more like Jesus. It's the process that God uses in our life to give us the character to handle the new assignment and the new future that he's taking us to. The suffering of Christ. Last of all, God's process in Paul is that he uses him in service. I want you to see the order. We don't like the order, but it's the way it is. Solitude. God gets our attention, and he gets us alone. Suffering. God uses the things that we go through, the tough things, the trials, the tragedies, the sufferings, the persecution, the mocking. He uses all of that to develop character for our new assignment. But then the good thing is the service. Now we get to verse 28. Look at this. I love this. And then he, Paul, was with them at Jerusalem, coming in, going out. He spoke boldly. By the way, you can't speak boldly if you haven't gone through suffering. Whenever I teach a preaching class, I always tell the guys, you preach better when you preach from your pain. If you hadn't had any pain, you probably don't want to preach. That's where the crushing is. That's where the anointing comes from. When God crushes us and uses the stuff that we go through. And out of that comes a boldness in your life to stand up for truth. That's what happened to Paul right here. He spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenist, but they attempted to kill him. And when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea, sent him out to Tarsus. Look at this. I love this. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, and they were edified. They were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they were multiplied. God used Paul in powerful service in the kingdom of God. No one who has ever lived except for Jesus Christ has ever impacted church history like the Apostle Paul. And it all changed. On that one eventful day, he never saw it coming. On that one eventful day, he was on his road to Damascus to murder some more Christians. But suddenly, he saw the light. And we find him over and over again, telling the story, sharing his testimony. Every time he met somebody, he was always telling them how he saw the light on the Damascus road and how his life was radically changed. Imagine what it must have been like where the Bible says in the city of Lystra, it says they stoned him and left him for dead. Now put, put, go there in your mind for a second. Imagine that. They stoned him and left him for dead. There he is laying on the ground. And, and the ones that stoned him probably turned around and started walking away. And all of a sudden, Paul starts moving around. Hey, guys, wait a minute. Don't leave yet. I got to tell you a testimony. I was so lost. 
I was so dark and wicked and evil. I was the chief of sinners. But one day on the road to Damascus, I saw the light. Imagine what it must have been like when he stood before King Agrippa on trial for his faith. And Paul stood there before the king and he said, Oh, king, let me tell you about how my life was such a mess. But one day on the road to Damascus, I saw the light. What it must have been like in his last days in Rome when that great man, that great apostle, laid his head in the guillotine and right before the blade came down to take his head off, they said to him, do you have any final words? <laughs> Saul, with his head just about to come off, says, as a matter of fact, I do. I was on the road to Damascus. I was the number one terrorist of Christianity. I couldn't stand them. And I persecuted them and I killed their sons and their daughters and raped them and murdered them. I was a despiser of everything that they stood for. I hated them. But one day, on the road to Damascus, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Here it is. I was blind, but now I see. And I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Let me tell you something today, friend. They may take your freedom. They may take your house. They may take your property. They might even take your head off. But one thing they can't take from us is our testimony on how one day we saw the light and our life was radically changed. Come on and give God a shout of praise today. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Out of darkness we come into your marvelous light. Glory to God. Well, would you bow your heads, please, today? Just between you and God, I want to ask you a question. Have you seen the light? Whoo! Have you seen the light? I believe I'm speaking to a Saul in the house today. You're in darkness. And God's coming into this house right now with His mercy light. He's shining it on your heart. And the Bible says when the light comes, the darkness cannot overpower it. Light is coming. Don't resist the goad. Don't resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Some of you in this house, you're not sure. You're not really sure if you're saved. Some of you know that you're not. You're living a life that doesn't please Jesus. You're living a lifestyle of sin, and you might have even said that you're saved, but you know you're really not. Come on. This is no day to play games with God. We are in the last of the last days, friend. It's time to get right. You say, how do I do that? 
It's as simple as ABC. You admit you're a sinner. Father, I need a Savior. The Bible says then you believe. You believe in your heart that God sent Jesus to pay the price for your sin. We can't save ourselves. Only Jesus can save us. And that God raised him again from the dead to give us new life. God's not interested in religion. He's interested in a relationship. And then the Bible says, see, if you'll confess the Lord, if you'll confess the Lord, he'll confess you before his Father and his angels. If you deny the Lord, he'll deny you. You say, why? Why so public? Why go public with our faith? Because Jesus hung on the cross publicly in front of everybody. Why can't you take a stand for Jesus Christ in these last days? We are living in a radical world, friend, and it's time to get people radically saved. So today, if you're in this house, and you know, you know that you know that you know you're not right with God, you'd say, Pastor, I need prayer. I need to come to Christ maybe for the first time, or maybe you've come to Christ before in your life, but you've fallen away. Don't you resist the goad. Don't you resist the conviction. Today's your day. Right now, if you hear the voice of the Lord speaking to you, if there's conviction in your heart right now, I want you to respond. I'm going to count to three, and you're going to raise your hand. And by doing so, you're going to say, Hey, preacher, I need to be prayed for. I want to pray for you right there in your seat. You can do it. Respond. Don't you go to hell for anyone. It's not worth it. And hell was not created for you in the first place. It was created for the devil and his angels. If you go to hell, you're going to a place that was never intended for you. God wants to take you to heaven. I want you to go to heaven. Come on. Are you ready? I'm going to count to three, and you're going to slip your hand up in the air. Are you ready? One, two, three. Put it up in the air right now. I'm searching through the building. God bless you all the way in the back. I see your hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud. One person raised their hand, and I thank God for that. I want to lead in a prayer today. Can we all pray it together to help this one individual? Say, dear Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. And I ask you today, forgive me. I trust in you alone as my Savior. Today I receive new life. I receive your Holy Spirit. Thank you for power to become a child of God. I'm going to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Give God a hand of praise today for the word. Thank you, Lord. We believe your word. We believe you seal it. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Everyone stand, if you will, today. I'm going to give one more altar call, and it's real simple. If you need prayer of any kind at all, there are a lot of needs in a large church. So I'm going to ask you if you have any need in your life whatsoever, emotional, financial, whatever it is, we believe God can either walk with you through that or He can do a miracle for you. Whichever way he chooses to do, we're going to trust him. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the message today. And before you leave, make sure you go to our YouTube page and subscribe and check out our website. New Life exists to love God and lead people to live a better story. So whether you're going to continue to listen to us online or come see us in person, we hope to see you again real soon.